Where do you turn to in times of difficulty? Join us today as we come to the God who is our strength and our refuge. Welcome to Parkside Evangelical Church. We welcome you in the name of the Lord Jesus. We're going to be hearing today from Dr. Brian Chappell. Dr. Chappell taught me to preach. He was the president of Covenant Theological Seminary when I was studying over there. And he's got a wonderful message from Psalm 46. Come now as we worship God and listen to the words of Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear. Though the earth gives way, though the waters be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter, he utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars to cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Oh, what glorious words those are. They should thrill our hearts. And now we have an opportunity to sing them. You recognise the tune to this. It's the tune to A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And obviously, Martin Luther, when he wrote that wonderful tune and those great words, was inspired by Psalm 46. But this is a very faithful rendition of the whole of that psalm. Will you sing it with me? as we lift our hearts into the presence of our mighty God.
pray with me? Almighty God, you are our refuge and our strength, and we need that place of safety. In the midst of all of the chaos of this world, in the midst of all of its sorrows and troubles, we need your strength. We need you to be a present help in our trouble. Oh, Heavenly Father, we want to drink from those streams that make glad the city of our God. We want to drink from that endless fount of the Holy Spirit being poured out into our hearts and our lives. Please send him down. We're no longer able to meet in this building at the moment, but Lord, we long to meet with you. We long to experience your goodness, your grace, and your power. Oh Lord, by faith we long to enter into that holy habitation, that heavenly place where you dwell, the spiritual Jerusalem, the heavenly Zion. Lord, we lift our hearts into that mighty fortress where you dwell forever and ever. We thank you and praise you. You've promised where two or three gather, you will be in our midst. We thank you and praise you, dear Lord, that you said that you would build your church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You will help us to prevail. You will help us to overcome. And even though, dear Lord, we live in a time where the nations rage and where kingdoms totter, we thank you that you are in control. We praise you and worship you that you are with us, that you are our mighty fortress. We come into your presence to behold your works and to see how you have overcome. We thank you and praise you, dear Lord, that we can silence ourselves in your presence. We can sense that you are our God. We thank you and praise you, dear Lord, that you are exalting your name among the nations at the moment. We thank you for this glorious promise, this guarantee that you will be exalted in all the earth. We thank you and praise you, dear Lord. Help us to love you and to worship you. We pray it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. This hymn that we've sung and also the words of Psalm 46 remind us that there are those times when it seems as if the mountains are flowing into the sea, as if we're in the midst of an earthquake. In our own personal lives, in the way that our world is at the moment, we need to know that our anchor holds. We sang this a quite a, lo a while ago at the beginning of this series of services that we've put onto YouTube it's a hymn written by my friend Luke Morton, My Anchor Holds.
within the deep Angry clouds will shade the sky And the tempest rises high But I've an anchor safe and sure That can evermore endure And it holds My anchor holds Through the wind And stormy blast And it holds My anchor holds Christ my Savior Will you pray with me? Almighty God, we come to you again and again. We come to you to be strengthened by you, to be blessed by you. This psalm has reminded, has reminded us of our great need. We are weak, but you are strong. The nations are in uproar, but you are in control. The mountains seem to flow into the sea, but you are are steadfast and sure. Nothing in this world is guaranteed. And Lord, we cling to the guarantees of the world to come. We cling to you, dear Lord, because your kingdom will never fail. But we sense our own fragility, our own frailty. We sense our own struggles. We need you, dear Lord, to get us through another week. Some of us are weak in mind. Some of us are weak in body. Some of us are weak in our anxiety for our friends and our relatives, our loved ones, those who are precious to you. And we need you. Oh, bless us and help us, dear Lord. Give us the strength that we need to overcome. Give us the hope that can only be found in Jesus Christ. Bless us, help us, comfort us, dear Lord. Draw close to us. Lord, we pray for our nation. We pray for this world. We see the uncertainty. We see, dear Lord, that people are confused. They're seeking a place of sanctuary, a place of refuge. They're seeking, dear Lord, something that will make meaning to their lives. We see, dear Lord, that We've sought out every possible thing except you. This nation, dear Lord, has turned to sex and to drugs. It's turned to entertainment. It's turned to sports. It's turned to all sorts of different things, to other religions, to uh, rejecting religion altogether. And nothing gives us unity. Nothing, dear Lord, gives us hope and peace and stability as a nation. And so, dear Lord, please help us to calm down. Help us to turn aside from these things. Clarify our thinking, dear Lord, so that we can see clearly. Send down your Holy Spirit to revive your church. Bless the nations again, dear Lord. Draw them into your glorious presence. Oh, dear Lord, please revive your church. Please, dear Lord, be with your people so that we will prevail. And we pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. The psalm reminds us to be still and know that I am God. We're now going to sing, Be still, for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One, is here.
as we honor God's word and consider the ways in which he is providing for us. Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way, though the mountains be moved in the heart of the sea, Though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Selah. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Come behold the works of the Lord. How he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still. And know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, but even more for what it promises, that you would be our refuge and our strength, a fortress in a world that seems like it often assaults us. But in your promise to be the God of Jacob and our God too, you are God who works in families and for the family of faith, through Jacob's family providing your son and ultimately our salvation. As we consider the mighty deeds of our God, would you help us think how we can be at peace again, not because our world has all calmed down, but because our hearts have. With confidence in you, may we say, Selah, amen, we trust you. This we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. You can imagine it, his wife's name, 
shows on the caller ID on his cell phone, but when he answers the phone, it's not the wife, it's the four-year-old who has somehow figured out the keypad and the speed dial to daddy. And the four-year-old says, Daddy, we've been in a wreck and mommy won't wake up. What does it mean, though the earth gives way and the mountains be cast into the midst of the sea, we will not fear? If you can take away the Hebrew poetry and a few centuries, what it means when you say the earth gives way is, Daddy, we had a wreck and Mommy won't wake up. Or, I'm sorry, the test came back positive and it's stage four. The earth gives way means I don't love you anymore and I've already packed my bags. The earth gives way means we don't need you anymore and security is here to escort you to your car. Though the earth gives way, what does that mean? We get it. We actually know what that means. But what does it mean to say, though the earth gives way and the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains tremble, we will not fear. How is that even possible? The purpose of this psalm is to say not only is it possible, it is the promise of God that because he is a mighty fortress, not just against the evils and the trials of the world, but for the sake of our hearts, that even when material things give way, when the earth about us trembles and our feet shake, our hearts need not, that we can still know peace in a world where there is none because of a God who is our refuge and strength. It is explaining what it means for a God to be a refuge and a river and to provide rest for our souls. That is this psalm's purpose. The opening words many of us know well. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. It's first just the promise that that God provides protection. He is a refuge. For the Israelites, when they heard this psalm, the referent that most of them will have in mind is a time in which the city of Jerusalem itself became that refuge, that fortress, the walls raised high on the high point that was Jerusalem to protect it from an enemy that was known as Assyria. What happened was this, Assyria had sent an army of 185,000 troops under King Sennacherib to attack Israel. The northern kingdom has already been decimated, wiped out. And now Sennacherib advances upon the southern kingdom and its capital, Jerusalem. Because the nation is not large, you know what is happening. The people of the southern kingdom have rushed into the fortress that is Jerusalem. The walls surround them. As they get into this high point of the fortress, surely they look to the north, and there they see the smoke of the cities that have already been ruined and ransacked. And they know that Sennacherib is coming with 185,000 to get them next. He actually sends a letter ahead of him. The letter addressed to King Hezekiah, who's also in the fortress at Jerusalem. And the letter says, if you surrender, I promise prosperity and peace. But if you don't, you die. Not only is the smoke rising from the northern cities, the refugees are already at the gate knocking 
and telling of the atrocities that Sennacherib has already visited upon them. Hezekiah, trembling with fears, takes the letter that has come from Sennacherib and he goes to the temple of God which has already been stripped of its gold and of its finery because they tried to pay a ransom to Sennacherib to to beg him not to attack the city. It's already failed. He's coming with siege forces. And because he has no resources left, no means to protect himself left, all that King Hezekiah can do is take the letter of Sennacherib and put it on the altar of God and say, God, we got nothing. You must be our refuge. You must protect us. We have nothing else. Save us, oh God. What does God do? That night he sends one angel. And that one angel on that one night wipes out 185,000 Assyrians. It will be told in Israel's history from that point forward. God is our refuge and strength. Not the city walls, not our wealth, not anything we can provide. God is our refuge and strength. Just a couple of side notes. We actually have the historical account of Sennacherib of the same event. Not from the Bible. Sennacherib's own account of this in the British Museum in London. And what Sennacherib records is that he went to siege Jerusalem and turned away from the city. It never says why he turned away. It just says he did not take the city. Second observation. If one angel could defeat 185,000, what would it mean 700 years later, when in the same city of Jerusalem, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Roman soldiers would come with a mob to take Jesus under arrest, and one of Jesus' disciples to protect him would strike the ear of one of the soldiers with a short sword, and Jesus would say, would you put away the sword? If it were my Father's will, he could send 12 legions of angels. A legion in Roman terms is 5,000 soldiers. Jesus says, my father could send 60,000 angels should he choose to. Now, if just one angel can defeat 185,000 soldiers, that means 60 thousand of God's angels could have defeated 11 billion soldiers, which is more than all the armies of all the nations of all the earth since history has begun. His power is greater. Our God is great. He is our refuge. And we turn to him recognizing how great is that power that he is promising to his people. But it is not just the power that surrounds us. It is not just the angels that are provided. Ultimately, he is our refuge and our strength. The refuge is the fortress language of what is around us. The strength is what is within that God is also promising to provide. He will provide what is necessary for us. Verse 4 says, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She, that is the city, shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. Now, again, we don't have the reference for that. But if you were in ancient Israel, you would know. What has happened? Sennacherib is coming with 185,000 to besiege the city. It will be easy to take Jerusalem. Here's the reason. Even today, most great cities that we know are founded on bodies of water, right? Lake Michigan, Chicago. Mississippi River, St. Louis. London, the Thames. Paris, the Seine. Shanghai? Yangtze? What? 
It's just obvious. You, you, you need a water source by a great city. But not Jerusalem. Jerusalem is on a high point in a desert. How do they get water? Well, at the bottom of the hill, outside the city walls, there was a spring known as the Spring of Gihon. And that's where they would go to get the water that was necessary for the sustenance of the city. But now Sennacherib is coming. How is he going to take the city? He doesn't even have to breach the walls. All he has to do is block their access to the spring, which is outside the walls. This will be easy. So Hezekiah recognizes what will happen. What does he do? He has his engineers go into a cave that's on the top of the hill in which the city sits, and he begins to drill straight down and then sends other engineers to the spring outside the walls and have them begin to dig over until a tunnel known as Hezekiah's Tunnel is built, connecting the spring to the city. You can still walk the tunnel with us if you want, if you go with us on the trip next spring. Now, you would wish that there were a little bit better engineers because when you're about in the middle of the tunnel where the two crews met, they were a little bit off. So there's a little zigzag there. They needed some of you engineers to help them out. But nonetheless, it worked. And you must recognize what that meant for the people as they hide the outside spring, camouflage it, put rocks and stones over it so Sennacherib can't get to it. And now they have water coming into the city. This is their security. This is their salvation. This is how they know they can survive. Despite the attack of what's around them, they will survive because of what is inside them. The spiritual significance will not really be known until 700 years later. For 700 years, the people continue to celebrate the salvation of God that has come by this spring coming up within the city now because they have at the Feast of Tabernacles a, a week of celebration every year in which they celebrate God has tabernacled. He's made his home with us. He's brought his presence with us. He's Emmanuel, God with us. They have the Feast of Tabernacles and every morning of the Feast of Tabernacles, they take water now from inside the city and they sprinkle the altar to say, God has provided our salvation. God is the one who has provided but when Jesus goes to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, he waits until the eighth day when no water is taken from the spring. The feast is over. And he instead says these words that will last forever. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and I will give him water. And this water will be a well welling up in him until eternal life. The ultimate promise was not the protection that was around from the forces, but rather the strength that would come welling up from within us by a union with the God of the universe. It was his provision. It was what was internal. It was what was spiritual that would provide the ultimate strength that God would provide for his people. It's, it's that that is our confidence, that God is not just providing protection from the outside. Ultimately recognize in a fallen and a cruel world, this world that is broken, that there are all kinds of things that will continue to attack God's people, but our ultimate support is what is within. Confidence that God will not abandon his purpose, nor will he abandon his people, but rather our faith with him will well up into confidence into eternal life and his preservation for our souls forever. It is the ultimate promise of strength, and it is what we claim when the trials are so hard and so bad. You, you have to think Martin Luther when he wrote that great mighty fortress is our God based upon the words of Psalm 46, he well knew how hard the world could be even when God was our refuge. Before he penned the words of a mighty fortress is our God, he was already a fugitive 
fleeing a church that was ready to kill him for claiming that we were saved by grace alone. Already his colleague, Leonard Kaiser, had been burned at the stake for holding to the same doctrine that Martin Luther was himself teaching. And now that you have read this psalm, you have to think of how much it weighed upon Luther to be strengthened from the inside, not just from the outside, when he wrote, and though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life all so. What is the truth that will be maintained? But that Lord Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, his name, is from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. Not because we survive, because his purposes survive, not because our bodies survive, because our souls are maintained eternally by his great work. And we trust him because we say he is working a purpose greater than we can discern, but through people that he loves. And so we look for those marks in our lives where he is our refuge and our strength. And we claim it when we go through the battles yet again. Is it real? Does it mean anything for us today? We've been on vacation. One of the weeks we were out in Colorado, went to visit a son, baptize a grandchild. Wonderful time. But we also went because our youngest daughter, Katie, is staying with our son and his family in Colorado this summer. You may remember three weeks ago at the end of this service, I asked some of you to pray with me for our daughter, Katie. She was in something of an emotional tailspin, had not gotten into the grad school that she wanted, went to spend some time with my son and his wife and their family in Colorado. The consequence was not only was she greatly disappointed about not getting to the grad school she wanted, she was now distant from her friends, from her support network, living in a new state. So you had to add to disappointment, isolation, and loneliness. And for Kathy and me, we just saw our daughter just emotionally lower than we have known her to be. And we were worried. And so I said at the end of this service, which some of you just come pray for me. I'm not sure how to help my daughter. Pray for my daughter. And Mike Jackson was the first to come up here and put his arm around me. And others of you gathered. And, and we prayed. And others prayed for other things. Now, I saw Katie, Kathy and I, took a little trip with her while we were out in Colorado. And as we were talking, we were, we were dealing with a different daughter. She was, she was back to her old self. She was ebullient and happy and joyful and fun like she usually is. We said, what happened? She said, well, last week, which would now be three weeks ago, she said, I, I went to a new church because I was told they had young people my age. And I went, and she said, there was nobody my age. <laughs> she said, I was frustrated and disappointed. And she said, I was walking out the door, and somebody tapped me on the shoulder and said, do you like to camp? And she said, yes. And they said, well, all our young people are out camping this weekend, but they'll be back tonight. And you could go to their meeting. And Kathy said, I went to the meeting. I've got all kinds of people who love what I love, and they love the Lord. And it, it, she said, Mom and Dad, it, it just changed so fast. Now, we had to do a little bit of the thinking back. <laughs> so I'm up here, and, and Mike has his armor on my shoulder, and we're praying for my daughter. And right at that moment, somebody's tapping my daughter on the shoulder in Colorado, and saying, do you like camping? And I think, you know, of the words of Scripture. While you are yet asking, I will answer, says the Lord. And so here we are praying. And the Lord is answering in a different place. Does it always happen that way? Of course not. 
But we have in our lives these, these Ebenezer stones, these, these rocks of remembrance that we say, all right, I'm going through a hard time now, but consider the deeds of the Lord. It's what Israel is doing in this passage. They, they certainly go through hard times, but they are considered. Remember how the Lord brought us out of slavery and the horse and rider of the Egyptians were thrown into the sea. Remember. And remember when we went into the promised land and there were the, the, the great enemies of God's purpose there, but the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. And remember when the kingdom was established and already we thought there was no hope because Sennacherib had taken out the northern kingdom and God sent just one angel and he provided. And they, they recount these tales of what God has done, remembering the deeds of the Lord. Because what we're ultimately being strengthened by is not just the removal of all evil in a fallen world, but the support of our souls. We have this river in us that is believing in the power and the goodness of God, and it is our strength for the world we face. There is no temptation taken you, but such as common to man. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted above what you are able, but will with the trial also provide a way of escape so that you can stand up under it. He is the God who gives strength as well as refuge. And it is that river that God is providing. It is that willingness to understand what he is doing that makes sense of these verses. He is this, this river God, this one who says, if you're thirsty, come to me. If you can't make sense of it, read my word. Here is the water meant to flow into your heart and your soul that you may be strengthened for whatever you have to face. The greater protection that God offers is not the removal of all ill. Heaven hasn't come yet. It will, but not yet. It is the confidence that he is at work so that we can stand up and face tomorrow and pray for those that we need to pray for. So a couple of thoughts. You might just think about who the Lord wants you to tap on the shoulder before you leave this service. And then you might remember some things the Lord has done in the past if your presence is a real struggle. So that you would pray, remembering the deeds of the Lord, the one who is our refuge and strength. Because something happens when you remember a God who is a refuge and a river. You find some rest. And that's what God is promising as well. How can we rest? Verse 6 The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. It's just a reminder that that he is powerful over all things. Here's the great expression, nations rage, kingdoms totter. God just says a word. And the whole earth melts. He's more powerful than all of that. At the same time, verse 7, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. It's it's not just that he's great out there somewhere. He's listening to Mike pray for me. (laughs) He's listening to our prayers for our daughter. The God of Jacob is with us. And what do you remember about Jacob? Conniver, liar, thief, idolater. And yet God is saying, you turn to me and I will help you because I'm the God of somebody like Jacob. And I actually take Jacob with all of his conniving and all of his weaknesses, and I use him to build a family out of which Israel, the family of faith, will come, out of which Jesus will come to save you. As though God is saying, I I have this, this infinite plan and I have this intimate plan. And they're operating right together so that you can you can rest in my purposes even when things don't make sense. Verse 9. He makes war cease to the end of the earth as though you say God is Lord Sabaoth, which means Lord of hosts, that the nations bring their forces, the the companies bring their lawyers, the family brings its ire, whatever is the issue we're facing. And God's saying, I'm greater than that. I'm Lord Sabaoth. I'm, I'm Lord of hosts. 
And it's, it's meant to give our hearts some rest to remember that he is Lord of hosts. But he's not just Lord of hosts. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He's the Lord Shalom. He's bringing peace to our hearts even when our lives are not experiencing that peace. How can there be peace? Verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. What brings us peace? It's just knowing that God is God. My God is God. The power that created the universe, the power that turned back Sennacherib, the power that sent Jesus, the heart that loves me past my sin, that God is my God. And when I recognize that, I I trust him. I think of Psalm 127, in vain do you rise up early and stay up late, eating the bread of anxious toil. Do you not know God gives to his beloved sleep? (laughs) You can rest. How can you rest? Because my God is God. That's how I can rest. I I may not be able to explain. I may not be able to see this ending in, in a way that makes sense to me or that I can figure out or that may happen even but in my lifetime, but but my God is God. And for that reason, I continue to trust him. He's got this because he's God. And not only is my God Lord Sabaoth, my God is here. He is, verse 11, the Lord of hosts who is with us. The God of Jacob who is our fortress. He is, he's not just Lord Sabaoth, he's Lord Emmanuel. God with us. And we need both pieces of that to actually have our hearts at rest. That he has all this power, but he's also with us for a caring and loving purpose that was ultimately revealed in Jesus. If I don't know that, I I won't truly be able to rest. I will focus only on the crisis and the fact that it's not done yet. Only on the enemy and that it's not destroyed yet. Only on the anger and that it's not calmed yet. But if what I say is, you know, sometimes I'm treated the way Hezekiah was. I have all my resources stretched and pushed away from me. No longer my walls work. No longer my army works. No longer my wealth works. That's gone. So what do I got left? God. It's all I got. It's all you need. And that God is with me. And because of that, I can still find rest when I'm going through the troubles that I can't make sense of. Kathy's brother is a a doctor in Springfield, a surgeon. And um, several weeks ago, he took a friend of his, a colleague, who's also a man of faith, to a cardinal game. And uh, they've known each other a long time, but we're kind of catching up on families and issues. And as these two men of faith were at the cardinal game, the friend began to speak to Kathy's brother of the trials in his life. He said, my daughter got married recently. Young guy, strong, strapping, vigorous, 30 years old, who had an inexplicable heart attack. Destroyed a large part of his heart. For that reason, he was put on a heart transplant list, and they just presumed they were in for a long, hard wait. But as the circumstances can develop and the priorities are listed, they got the call. There is a heart available, and you're going into surgery tomorrow. You know, they were hardly recovered from the trauma of 
the heart attack and they're having to face now his possible loss in a heart transplant operation. So the families at the hospital, they're gathered in the waiting room while the surgery begins. And the friend who's sitting there at the Cardinal game with Kathy's brother says, here's what I did. I have a Bible app on my smartphone. So I just open it up to the verse of the day. Now, folks, there, there are about 31,000 verses in the Bible. This is the verse that showed up on the Bible app that day as the verse for the day for this man whose son-in-law was going into heart transplant surgery. Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart. And I will put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. So said the friend, we knew that despite it all, the Lord was still with us. Now, I would tell you, Kathy's brother doesn't know who won that Cardinal game because he said, we just wept for the next few innings. Two men of faith saying, we don't understand all these events, but God is our refuge and strength. The God of Jacob is with us. And because of that, we know that though the earth gives way, we can be still and know that God is God and God is with us. And so we will find rest for our souls. So may God do his work in your heart. Even when the enemy is pushing in and your walls are not big enough to stop it. That you would know the river of Christ that is peace to your soul because you have united your heart to his and know that he is now for you. And though the earth gives way, you can be still and know that he is God. Selah. Amen. Father, so bring your truths to our hearts that we who face a real world might know a present God who is Lord Sabaoth, Lord of hosts, and Emmanuel, God with us, that whatever we must face, we can do so with the God who has secured our souls forever and is working through us for eternal purposes. Grant that we may know him. Be at peace and be still in the presence and the care of our God in whose name we pray, amen. I hope and pray that those words of Dr. Chapel were an encouragement to you, but we need to live them out. And we're gonna think about how to do that as we sing the words of our final hymn, Make Me a Channel of Your Peace. to love
with me. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. I hope and pray that this was a blessing for you. If it was, please like it and share it on the YouTube channel. Click, the, uh, click that uh, thumbs up button. Click the share button and put it onto social media. Share it with your friends on Facebook. Uh, send an email link to other people. Let other people know that God can be their refuge and their strength. May God richly bless you until next week. Amen.